out of the corner of my eye, I saw a woman with long dark hair wearing what appeared to be a white gown with her arms stretched out, rushing at me with the intent to physically shove me through a window. I stopped, dropped down, grabbed the ladder with my left hand, and spun to my left to see whoever was upstairs trying to do me grievous physical harm, and there was no one there. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. Hello and welcome back to part two of our Halloween series on haunted houses, apparitions, paranormal experiences, and the roommates who don't pay rent and can't be evicted. In part one, you were introduced to a retired reverend who has been experiencing paranormal activity and communicating with the dead since his near-death experience at the age of five. Today, we're going to take you on a ghost hunting adventure to a haunted house in the historic district of Bay City, Michigan. But before we go there, I want to talk with you about the veracity of what you've heard so far and what you're about to hear. If there's anything I've learned from the short time I've spent with Reverend Hunter, it's that experiencing paranormal phenomenon can be confusing and subjective. It's also very hard to prove. I'll give you some examples. In part one, Reverend Hunter shared his experience and audio recording from the historic Fort Wayne in Detroit. Reverend Hunter both heard and recorded on his audio recorder the following. <laughs> It's interesting to note that his video camera did not pick up any video or audio. It was only his audio recording equipment that captured that voice. <laughs> Melissa, one of Reverend Hunter's research assistants, also recorded something that can't be explained. We were doing an investigation of the Heartland Music Hall in Heartland, Michigan, and we were in the costume room. We didn't feel, hear anything at the time in the room. And the next day, I started listening to all of my audio. I can hear something along the lines of a sigh, a breath of air, a whoosh. There's something over my voice that I can't explain. I don't either. Okay, we're back in the basement, 2.06 a.m. And what I can't figure out is who that is. Okay, we're back in the basement. Then you have Anne, another paranormal researcher, who not only recorded something strange, but also found physical evidence as well in a retired naval destroyer called the USS Edson in Bay City, Michigan. We were all down in 9-11 room and I had the keys and, and I had the ship all locked up and we were asking questions and that. And then all of a sudden we all heard something like it got thrown down the ladder. What the heck? I heard a penny fly. Is something coming down the stairs? No, it sounded like a penny drop. Well, what was that? I don't know, but that's really weird. We're getting activity now, big time. And I thought it was maybe a bolt or something come out of the ladder. We went to go and look, and here, uh, a nickel, 1946 nickel. And it sounded like somebody just threw it down, threw it right down from up above. It's interesting that not only do you hear the nickel drop from above, but you can also hear a whoosh or a breath, similar to what Melissa had recorded in Heartland, Michigan. And finally, there's another story Reverend Hunter tells, in which he spent the night alone as an adult at his haunted childhood home. He set up a video camera at the bottom of the stairs and heard something very unexpected when he played it back the next morning. I never saw a thing, but about 10 minutes into the recording, an old man's voice clear as a bell, hello, hello, hello. And then he recited, Mary had a little lamb very slowly. 
And then he would go, ha, ha, ha. And so I just, you know, got my attention. I sat up in, in the rocking chair I was in and stared at the TV. And a few minutes later, he came on again and did the exact same thing, only with different inflections. You could tell it was his second shot at reciting Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then did the ha, ha, ha. And so I'm getting ready to pick up the cell phone and call my brother, who was now the town cop, and have him come over to Mom's house. But before I could dial, I started hearing a lot of women talking. And, and it sounded like, from where the, the way the camera was set, that it was all upstairs. Now, I couldn't understand what they were saying, but it sounded like a lot of women talking. And it's like listening to people speak when you're on the other side of a wall. But then... About five minutes into that, I heard one man's voice rise above everyone else's and very clearly. He said, whoever's going downstairs, stay to the left of whatever that is down there, meaning my camera and tripod. And then we started getting music and some more voices. And so I called my brother. He came over and I was very excited and I started playing it. And eventually he just said, shut it off. I don't want to hear this. Shut it off. I sent that tape to a friend of mine who has a professional recording studio. He said that every sound has its own frequency. And he said, what I want to do is I want to isolate these frequencies and get rid of all of them except for these voices that we're listening to. And about three weeks later, I called him because I hadn't heard anything. And he said, Jerry, we got a problem. And I said, well, what? Is the tape okay? And he said, yeah. He said, I can't isolate those voices. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, they don't have their own frequency. And I said, how is that possible? And he said, it isn't. And I said, well, then how are we getting these voices? He said, I don't know. I can't isolate them. It's like they're a part of all the other frequencies. But at the same time, when I eliminate those frequencies, they're still there. So he sent it to Wayne State, where they looked at it and came to the same conclusion. And their engineer told him, and he told me, he says, you're right. We can't isolate this. And uh, when we asked you know, him how is it possible, he also confirmed it's not possible. We can't explain this. Unfortunately, for our purposes, that recording was never returned to Reverend Hunter, and he didn't make a copy. So, if I can't play it for you, does that mean it didn't really happen? If you trust Reverend Hunter and the others you've heard on this show, then it's a lot easier to believe and accept that they experienced and sometimes recorded real paranormal phenomena. The skeptic, however, would ask, how do we know that these events aren't just fabrications by those who want so hard to believe in the paranormal that they're willing to accept and do anything to prove its existence? The answer is that we don't know for sure, and we likely never will. The only real proof that can be accepted is the proof that comes from experiencing paranormal phenomenon directly. Which brings us to Bay City, Michigan, where a young couple bought a three-unit historic property with the intentions of rehabbing it and renting it out to create positive cash flow. But the further they got into the project, the more they realized that they were in a lot deeper than they ever imagined. This is a Queen Anne Victorian. It was built in 1887. We purchased it in 2016. We couldn't stop thinking about the house, which is surprising even considering its tragic state of disrepair. But it was something about the house that just got its, its hooks in us and we kept thinking about it. We laid awake after the first night we did a walkthrough of the house and we were just sitting there in bed talking to each other about the house itself in spite of the fact that it was not in good condition. We bought the house with the intent of maintaining it as a rental, but as we went through the renovation process, every layer we peeled off revealed another layer that needed to be peeled off, so we converted it back into a single family home. That's Aaron and Jill from Bay City, Michigan. Reverend Hunter and his team were invited to their home because they'd been experiencing things that couldn't be explained. I was invited to join them as well, and we all sat down in their dining room on September 10th, around 9 p.m., to record this conversation. Uh, the first time, our contractor who was managing the process of the renovation, he subcontracted out a painter 
to work on the interior, do some painting of the drywall. He was in the house alone by himself and he heard feet coming up the main stairwell. So he thought it was Joe, our contractor, coming just to check on him, see how the progress was going. Uh, so he actually called down and said, hey Joe, what's going on? And there was no response, uh, but he had heard feet coming upstairs to where he was on the main stairwell. So he stopped, looked around and there was no one in the house. He said he went from room to room just to make sure no one had like wandered in or that someone or Joe wasn't in a different room in the house, but he says, no, at the end of it, he was, he was still alone by himself. At one point he thought it was like a light footsteps, like almost like a little kid. He said it kind of freaked him out a little bit. I didn't think too much of it. I was just kind of like, well, you know, it was this one instance that happened. Okay, maybe we got a ghost. Ha, yeah. ha, ha. And <laughs> Let's get under the drywall. <laughs> I wanted the floor going in. <laughs> there was a lot going on Across at this period. We're kind of, I think yeah. a ghost at the point was like the least, least of our, of our problems. Aaron is the only one who witnessed what happened next. And as you'll hear, he does his best to rationalize it. So I was standing on a ladder by myself in the house. He didn't tell me about this till quite a long time later on. <laughs> so anyways, I was on top of a ladder, three steps up, just uh, standing there, reaching over my head to pull down some of the old paneling. Uh, and I had safety glasses on, standing next to a window, sun was shining through the window, everything seemed fine. Out of the corner of my eye on the left, I saw a woman with long dark hair wearing what appeared to be a white gown with her arms stretched out rushing towards me and i don't mean just like coming over to say hi i mean the the clear intent of that split second visual was that someone was rushing at me with the intent to physically shove me through a window in that moment rational or not that's what my brain said was happening the snapshot of that was so sharp that I, I stopped, dropped down uh, as well as a person can on the ladder, grabbed the ladder with my left hand and spun to my left to see whoever was upstairs trying to, trying to do me grievous physical harm. And there was no one there. So at that point I stepped off the ladder, took a breath, rationalized and said, okay, it was probably the sun. I've got dirt on my safety glasses, probably the sun shining through the window, reflected somehow off the, the side of the glasses, and that's what I saw. Uh, I just sort of nodded, got back on the ladder, and got back to work. Now, has your daughter picked up on anything? Other than the monsters in the sky. <laughs> This was kind of what last year mm -hmm. that she would just sit there in, in her room and she'd point up at the ceiling and go, monsters in the sky, monsters in the sky. You know, you'd look up and you really didn't see anything. We have a ceiling fan in there, but there wasn't really anything else. Yeah, she did it in the kitchen a couple of times, pointing to a completely vacant section of the ceiling saying, monsters in the sky. And just like, what are we talking about? Can you draw it? It's like, nope. But then asking her the other day, I'd say, are there any ghosts here? And she looks at me and goes, no ghost mama and then and then i'll be like is there monsters here and she's like no monsters mama jerry i want to bring you in here you've mentioned that a lot of times when rehabs occur in, in a house that upsets spirits or ghosts do you think that that's possibly what could be happening here yeah that's one possibility definitely when houses are being renovated if there is a spirit in the house and they are there because they feel like this is my place. What are you doing here? And now you're altering it. Uh, they're going to get your attention. They're going to show their displeasure. What jumped out at me with what Aaron said was uh, he thought perhaps it was specks of dust on, on his glasses. I know that when we have these things happen to us, we live in such an objective reality all around us that the subjective part of life kind of gets pushed to the back burner. And, and that's how we can function in the world. And so when we do experience something extraordinary or out of the normal, the first thing we want to do is try to explain it away very quickly. Even if it's very obvious to us, it doesn't fit our objective reality. And uh, so I kind of smiled to myself when he said maybe it was some dust or something on his glasses because I've worn glasses all my life. I have a lot of experience with dust all over them. 
And I've never once mistaken it for anything other than dust that aggravated me on my glasses. <laughs> so I, I really don't have any doubt in my mind that, uh, that you had an experience that was out of the ordinary for you. And it's normal to say, maybe it was just this, maybe it was just that, because I think we do need to try to disprove these events in an attempt to prove them. So it's perfectly normal to have a reaction like that. At the same time, he's still talking about and being able to describe what the woman looked like, what she was doing, what color her hair was, what she was wearing, how her arms were outstretched, and she was rushing toward him, not walking quickly, but rushing toward him. And then his response to protect himself. Uh, to me, you know, that's a little more than dust on glasses. And this is not the first time that I've heard of, of workmen who have experiences like this, not just footsteps, but tools missing and showing up somewhere else. Doors closing. I've talked with one painter who actually painted a room and came back the next day to start another room. The house had been locked up. And when he looked at the first room that it was already finished, there was now fresh paint of a different color just splashed on the walls. All right, let me let me stop you. Yeah, go right ahead. You, you just, Aaron. Yeah, you, yes. you know, he said something that reminded me of a, a, another thing that happened when we had like the contractors going through. Uh, when we were getting closer, we were getting the kitchen cabinets installed. We had some of our possessions still in storage. Some of our possessions were in the basement. At one point in time, I got a text message from the contractor, Joe, and he said, hey, were you up here? I was like, no, I haven't been up there for, since last weekend. I said, why? He said, well, the rollerblades. I said, what rollerblades? Oh, the rollerblades. The rollerblades, yeah. So he said, well, there's, these, about the there's these rollerblades in the kitchen. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? And he's like, there's rollerblades up here. And so he took a picture and sent it to me, and uh, it, it was a pair of rollerblades. Were those that, mine? They were your rollerblades. My rollerblades, yeah. yeah. A pair of Jill's rollerblades that were in the basement previously, and I know because I put them in the basement, uh, they were in the kitchen, leaning up against... Uh, some of the, the cabinets of the kitchen. Them. Completely forgot about it until it just kind of <laughs> cued a memory in my mind. Now I remember so, yeah. that, yeah. And, and Joe went through and he validated all the doors, all the windows were locked. He unlocked the door to get into the house. And at that point in time, we didn't have anyone else that had access to the, the key. So a pair that, of rollerblades made it from the basement. That's interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. uh, that's an example, too, about how things will happen to us. And that's not the way the world is supposed to work. That's not what we're taught about the world. And so we shoot it to our unconscious mind. And then when we sit around like this and talk about these things, all of a sudden it pops back. Oh, yeah, this happened. Oh, yeah, that happened. There's much more to this world than just the objective reality around us. There's the subjective experience of what it means to be human. And that's why I don't see these kinds of things as being bad. Uh, we call them paranormal, which means extra normal, otherly normal. But we, we can't ignore that word in paranormal. We can't ignore the word normal. It's still a normal part of what it means to be human. If we start to accept these things as being real, to do so means we have to open ourselves up to try to understand what it's all about and explored even more. I think I'm more likely to believe a lot of this stuff than Aaron. He seems he's always been the more rational and and kind of kind of jealous that I didn't, you know, get <laughs> almost pushed off a ladder. But <laughs> but then we might have sold the house. And then but I'm hoping that it's kind of calming down. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. It's hard to explain what happened next. In fact, for most of the night, I was convinced that nothing was happening, but I was wrong. Join me as we take you through the timeline of that evening with a mixture of audio we recorded in the home as well as a follow-up conversation recorded a week later. Okay, it's 1.20 on September 
Oh my gosh, the 11th? Yeah. Is it? It's September oh my 11th. Oh gosh. Yeah. After Aaron and Jill went to bed, we spent some time in the living room with our recording equipment. Our goal was to ask questions with the hope of getting some sort of response from any spirits present. Quite often you may not hear that response in the moment, but when you play back your recording, you never know what you'll find. Yeah. Just start by asking, is there anyone here with us? Is there any man watching us now? Is there a woman watching us now? Are you in the room with us right now? Did you die in this house? Yeah. At 2 a.m., we decided to split up. Reverend Hunter, Anne, and Mandy stayed downstairs in the living room to continue asking questions. Melissa and I went upstairs to observe. I was sitting in the guest room. Can you confirm that the guest room was right next to Evie's room? Uh, yeah, that's correct, shared wall. Melissa was sitting just outside the door in the hallway. While Brian and I were upstairs, we were under the impression that Jerry and Ann and Mandy were going to be leading a question and answer session from the downstairs. It was about 2.15 when I started to do the question and answer session. Yeah. Is there something you want us to know? Do you know where you are? Yeah. We did hear some question and answers, but then it got really quiet. I could hear them from downstairs, but after like maybe two, three, four questions, they just stopped. And we sat up there for probably another 20 minutes just waiting. And that the whole time we sat there, we heard nothing. Which prompted me to stop recording and go down the hall and kind of duck in to Brian. We finally said, hey, what happened to those guys downstairs? Did they just fall asleep or what? And we went downstairs to, you know, ask why they weren't talking, why it got so quiet. So, well, why'd you guys stop asking questions? What's going on? And they said, well, we stopped when Evie started crying. We started to do the question. I only got like three or four questions asked. When I heard the child, she was talking very loudly in her sleep like kids do when they're having a bad dream. And then she started calling out for a parent. And that lasted, I thought, like 10 or 12 seconds. And I thought I was, uh, we did it now. We woke up the parents and we woke up Evie and we're going to get kicked out of this place. And I, only to find out 20 minutes later, the people upstairs never heard a thing. The three of them are saying, you didn't hear her crying. I mean, she's been crying. She's been wailing and it was really loud. Brian and I were really confused because we had just been upstairs and we didn't hear anything. First of all, Jill had told us that once Evie falls asleep, she's out. She doesn't wake up. So I thought it was odd from that perspective. From the other perspective is that if I was right next to her room and Melissa was right outside in the hallway, we would have heard her louder and clearer than the people downstairs. That's what I don't understand is how Brian and I didn't hear Evie when we were the closest to her bedroom. I don't know. I, no I don't know because it's pretty easy <laughs> to hear Evie anytime she's like chatting in her room from yeah. downstairs, but it's much easier to hear upstairs. Yeah. While we were all standing downstairs trying to make sense of what we did or didn't hear, Evie woke up for real and began calling out for her mom and dad. We heard her again and all of us downstairs heard her then. Us for the second time, Brian and Melissa for the first. I can't remember she was saying mommy, mommy or daddy, daddy, but it was very loud and very easy to hear. And at that point, I'm pretty sure that I heard you get up, Aaron. I heard it. I woke Aaron up because I put her to bed. So I was just like, well, I'll make him go in there and, and you know, take care of her. And I went into her room, checked on her, said, hey, are you okay? She said, yeah, just very groggily. I said, you want me to sleep in here? She said, yeah, very groggily. And then we both lay down and called it a night again. It wasn't until the next day that we were able to check our recordings. It turns out that the crying that everyone downstairs was convinced they heard the first time wasn't audible on anyone's devices. With the exception of a short moment of whimpering, Evie never made a sound. My audio and Anne's audio both catch the same 
three to four seconds of EV whimpering at about 2.18 to 2.20 a.m. Um, I heard that in real time. My audio supports that, and Anne's audio also caught that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Jerry, did when you heard Evie the first time while Melissa and I were upstairs, did you hear anyone get up to go check on her? Yes. I heard footsteps going down the hallway above us. We all did. And I and I thought, man, we're in trouble. Not only did we wake up Evie, but now either dad or mom is up. Yeah, it wasn't us. You know, it just it wasn't. Uh... I didn't get out of bed the whole night. The strange thing about those footsteps is that they would have happened around 2.20 a.m., but Melissa and I were watching the upstairs hallway and we didn't see anyone. While I played back my audio, I hear noises that sound like they're either footsteps or they sound like they're kind of pounding noises. So we know what we heard downstairs. We know it was a little girl's voice. And we also know that at the same time, we heard footsteps going from the master bedroom down toward Evie's room. Now, this would have been about 2.12 to 2.15, somewhere in through there. So that's what we know. And we know that we all heard it the second time. That's another thing we know. What we don't know is what we have to speculate, and I don't like speculating, but I do know from doing this for 30 years, when I have been places where uh, it was obvious that a spirit was speaking in somebody else's voice or, or coming across as an adult coming across as a child, those kinds of things, we've had that happen. The crying and the footsteps are definitely a mystery, but it turns out that's not the only strange thing that happened that night. The next day, Reverend Hunter received an email from Aaron. He was wondering if any of us had gone in Evie's room that night after he had gotten up to check on her and fallen asleep in her bed. Reverend Hunter assured him that we were all together and no one would have gone in her room after she was put to bed, which makes what Aaron experienced in Evie's room all that more puzzling. The reason I woke up was because it felt like someone was moving the blanket or one of Evie's stuffed animals near the foot of the bed. Uh, so I, I opened my eyes and kind of tilted my head up to the side and looked over my shoulder. And I, I don't know why I thought, oh, that's Jill. Uh, she just came in to check on us. I laid back down. I went to sleep. And it's strange the the actual words, it's okay, I'm safe filtered through my mind. <laughs> very, very bizarre, but those were the literal words that went through my mind. And then I went to sleep and I, I, I was thinking about that when I woke up fully in the morning around 6.20 or so, got up and started going through my morning routine. Uh, and I started to recollect that the, you know, when I looked at the end of the bed, uh, it wasn't Jill in the sense that, you know, it's not the person I've been married to for 19 years. It was more of a a shadowy shape, kind of human shape, shadowy form. I, I imagine if you took a picture of a person and then you just cover, colored over it with like a dark charcoal pencil. Uh, so you can still see the shape of what's there, but you can't really make out any, any definitive features. So that, I don't know, I, I tilted. Looked, saw that, thought, oh, that's Jill. I went back to sleep at that point in time. Jill, when you talked to Aaron the next morning and he told you what he saw, tell us what he described to you and your reaction to it, please. Well, he described um, like a really dark shape and he thought it was he thought it was me or somebody in there. And he said he thought that they were either moving a blanket or the stuffed animals. I mean, I was surprised because I'm sitting there thinking, did I get up? 
And I know I didn't get up because I know I purposely made a decision not to get up. When Aaron told me what he saw, I, it's, it's kind of, I've slept in Evie's room many times and laid in Evie's room many times when she's going to sleep. That room, once you're accustomed to the darkness, you can make out everything in the room. If you, you would know there's somebody in the room because the light from the streets um, and the turret and everything is, it really illuminates the room pretty well. What, what is your takeaway then from that presence? What do you think you saw and, and how does it make you feel? I saw what I have described and that's about as much as I'm willing to <laughs> entertain. For people who want to read into it with a spiritual perspective, they might say it was a ghost or some sort of spirit. Other people might say I was you know, only partially awake and just saw something. Uh, for me, individually, I'm not too disturbed by it because, again, when I was in the room, when I saw that, I felt fine. Thus far, what we've got is a little girl talking that three of us heard and the two closest to her room did not hear. Footsteps that Dad didn't make that you guys didn't hear and we did hear. So something's going on in the house, and you couple that with the form that Aaron saw. And again, here comes the speculation and what we want to try to disprove in order to prove. And that is, could that be the woman that tried to push you off the ladder? Is she protective about the little girl? Is she the one that started mimicking the little girl's voice to get mom or dad to come down to the room? We don't know. And that's all speculation, and we don't want to say that's the case. But what we want to do is get back into the house and be intentional. I mean, what's the closest you've experienced in your past 30 years to this situation of, of only half of us being able to hear Evie? Oh, wow. Um, that's only happened a couple of times. Almost always when we're sitting in close proximity to one another, we will hear the audio phenomena together. Uh, we may not always see it together because we're located in different areas or we're looking in different directions. But only a couple times in all the years I've done this have we actually sat where we should all be able to hear something very clearly and, in fact, didn't. And it's almost as though in those instances, the spirits want certain people to hear it and don't want others to hear it. And that's another ex unexplainable thing. So there you have it. We can tell you what happened, but we can't explain it. And the truth is, I never actually experienced anything myself that night. I didn't hear Evie crying, I didn't hear the footsteps, and I certainly didn't encounter the presence in Evie's room. So it's left up to you, the listener, as to whether you believe we encountered paranormal activity, or it can be explained in a more rational way. But I do know there are some of you who are encountering similar experiences in your home, rental property, or place of business. If you'd like to contact Reverend Hunter, you can do so through his publisher at Thunder Bay Press. Thank you, and if you enjoyed these two episodes, please share them with as many people as possible. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group, and you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 